rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. For those who watch this TV program this morning, I'd like to welcome you to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If you take your Bibles and open up to Zechariah chapter 1, we talked about last week, one of the characteristics of our God is that He's a jealous God. Our God gets jealous when His people, not the rest of the world, in the Old Testament, the Jews were God's chosen ones, and God got jealous over the Jews. But he didn't get jealous over the rest of the nationalities. In, today in the church, under the New Testament dispensation, the church is the spiritual Jews. Not those who are born physically a Jew. They're not the Jews of God. The church is. And the church is whom that God gets jealous over now when we go a whoring around after other gods. And that's the way the Bible says it. Back in the Old Testament, the Jews, after God showing them uh, His commandments and what He wanted them to do and the things that they should do and the things that they shouldn't do and the people whom they could hang around with and the people whom they couldn't, hang around with. When they disobeyed God, he became jealous because that put the Jews, his people, in a position of going a whoring around. And we talked a little bit about that. We know what it means to go whoring around. We see it, it takes a lot of place, uh, a lot of times here in the world. You know, uh, a man may go a whoring around on his wife or a woman may go whoring around on her husband. That means they're having sexual relationships with other individuals other than their married husband or wife. So it is in the church today. We are called the bride of Christ. And Jesus is the bridegroom. I hope I said that right. And he's the husband. And the church, both male and female in the church, is the wife. He's the husband, and we're the wife. And we're to carry his name. We know how that is. When Joanne married me, her last name became Jones. It is not Thorn anymore. It became Jones. She took on my last name. And so it is with the church today. We, when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, after we repented of our sins, we married him. He became our husband, and we became his wife, and we take on his name. See, Christian. In Isaiah chapter uh, 62, the Bible says that with the Lord's own mouth, he gave us a new name. And that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. It says the Christians... The, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Christian is the name that we received when we married the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes the husband according to the Bible. And we become his wife. You see, the other denominational so-called churches in the world today call themselves Christians but if they didn't become a Christian way the Bible says, they're not Christians. They cannot call themselves Christians because Christian is the name that the Lord gives His people. In the denominational world, they're not His people. Now I know that's going to uh, cause a ruckus with some people, but the Bible says that not, um, in Matthew chapter 7, that not everyone that says, Lord, you're Lord, going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's what Jesus said. You know, if I was to go to the Baptist church, the Methodist church, and the uh, uh, Lutheran church, and 
uh, the Pentecostal church, and there's a whole host of names that I could list. And the name does not represent Christ at all. And therefore, he does not get the honor from it. Some man does. And if I was to go there, and I was to ask those people, how did you get saved? What was the plan of salvation for you? If they did not tell me what Peter said on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, they did not do what the Lord said. They did not obey His will. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 in chapter 7, that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, only those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now when his church, okay, when his bride, his wife, and goes out and mixes and intertwingles with these other denominations, we're going to whoring. And God gets jealous, and rightly so. Who, in her, who here that is a wife or a husband would not get jealous if your wife or husband was seeing another man or a woman? Would you not get jealous and get angry? Absolutely we would. God is no different. He gets angry, he gets jealous when his bride, his wife, goes a whoring around. You see, we're not to mix and intertwingle with the Baptist church and the Methodist church and the Lutheran church and the Catholic church and the Pentecostal church and I can go on, 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 on. The only need that they have for us is to see Christ in us, to see the truth in us. Yeah, well, we'll go to the store and there'll be denominational people there. We'll go to school, and there'll be denominational people there. We'll go to work, and there'll be denominational people there. We'll walk down the street and say hi to denominational people. That's not what it's talking about, my friend. It's talking about when we begin to agree, to agree that they are the same as we are. When we begin to agree that they pray in the name of Jesus the same way that we do. When we begin to agree that they can get saved the way they do it by asking Jesus to come into their heart or say the sinner's prayer, and we begin to agree that we can repent and be baptized, have our sins washed away, and it's the same thing. When we begin to agree that they can partake the Lord's Supper whenever they want to, and we partake of it every Sunday, and it's okay, you see. We can, when we begin to agree that it's not essential to be baptized, to be saved. When we agree that it's not in, as important to study the Bible every day and to pray to God every day. You see, when we begin to agree that every brother and sister in Christ is as important as the other in the eyes of God. And we should be excited to be around our brothers and sisters in Christ as much as we're excited to be around our brother, physical brothers and sisters and our aunts and our uncles and our friends and our neighbors. We ought to be just as excited. And when we're not, it's because we're going to horn around. We're not being the wife, the bride that we became when we're baptized into Jesus Christ anymore. And our God gets jealous. And that jealousy brings forth, brings forth wrath and anger. Sometimes we don't think. I remember being in school. Young smart aleck. About the 7th grade or 8th grade. And I was the toughest person in the room. Of course we know how we are. And me and this other smart aleck, we uh, never did do our homework and we always caused trouble in class. And our teacher, he was already in his 60s and he looked sick and he was small and he was slender. And he came over to us and he says, I'll make a deal with you. You either stay after school and do all your homework and get it caught up or go up to the office and I give the both of you each two licks. 
Well, we laughed at him. We didn't think he could even probably pick up a paddle, much less give us licks. And we laughed at him. He says, meet me up in the office. So we went up there, and we were standing inside the office there, and soon there he came. And he pointed at me, at uh, the, the other boy first, and he went in. And he told him to touch, reach down and touch his ankles. His ankles. And he gave him two swats. And that boy come out there, he was, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, with tears in his eyes. And I said, uh-oh, it's my turn. So I went in there and he said, reach over and touch your ankles. And I did. When I looked behind me, he had a paddle that long. And he swung it like a ball bat. He hit me the first time I thought that the skin, the hide was ripping right off of my legs. And I said, oh no, I get another one of these. And he smacked me again. And from then on, we did our homework. You see... We had respect for that man now. What about our God? You know, hold your place there in Zechariah. Let's go to Hebrews and chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. What about our God when he corrects us? Does it cause us to have the same respect Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> Starting with um, verse 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, speaking of Jesus of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing your dull of hearing. For when for time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles, the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now these are reasons why God will um, correct his people. If the troubles in our life begin, the root of the problem begins with us not studying God's word. There's where the root of the problem begins. Because God's Word is the help, and the Holy Spirit is the help that God uses to mold you and make you, to make you what He wants you to be and not what we want us to be. And therefore, when we don't study, we need to be taught again over and over and over and over again. When we're in that situation and have to be taught over and over and over again, we haven't got through the first principles of the oracles of God. We have not grown and matured, and therefore we are unskilled in the Word. If we're unskilled in God's Word, then we can't share it with anybody. We can't share the good news with anybody. We can't share heaven with anybody. And we're like the denominational churches, you see. They serve God. They have a righteousness, but not according to knowledge. God does not work miracles and signs anymore. God does not base His commandments upon feelings and emotions, but He bases His commandments on facts that are written in His Word. And therefore, we need to be skillful in God's Word because when we serve Him and honor Him, it's according to knowledge. It's according to that we know. Anyone ask you who, you know, Anybody ask you, uh, if you're a Christian, if you're going to heaven, what was your answer? Did, did, did you say, I hope so, or maybe so? Or did you say, I know that I'm going to heaven? Why? Because I know what the Bible says. I have knowledge of what God says. My salvation is not based upon my, how I feel, my friend. Because I can tell you, last week there was probably a couple of days that I didn't feel real good. Okay? 
but it's based upon knowledge and facts. So whether I feel good or not, I can know what the Bible says, how what God says that I'm going to heaven because I've been obedient to what he says. Yeah. Also in Hebrews chapter 5, there are reasons, excuse me, There are reasons why God will correct His children. Get where I need to be here. The Bible teaches that whom God loveth, He correcteth. God loves His children the children of God. When we do wrong, when God says it's wrong, okay? Not when man says it's wrong. When God says it's wrong, we do wrong. God loves you men enough to correct us, to try to turn us out of the way of wrong and doing that which is right. He will not just leave you alone. Some people think that, and I have probably done that in my life, some people think, well, I can get by with this and no one ever bother me. Well, that may be true, but God will never forget it unless we repent of it. God will not leave you doing wrong. He will correct you. There will something take place in your life that will be a spiritual spanking to open our eyes to lead us back in repentance to doing what God wants us to do. And the root of that problem is, is not studying God's Word. When that takes place, we begin to do things that God, and I referred to this last week, who is our husband or our, bri- or our bridegroom, and we are the wife, when we are not studying God's Word. Now listen, folks, this is important. When we're not studying God's Word, we begin to do things that displease Him. And he gets jealous. We must study God's Word so that we can make our husband happy, if you will. Okay? The bridegroom happy. Our Lord happy. We must study to be able to do that. You cannot please God apart from studying His Word. The denomination world is all mixed up. They have been deceived. The denomination world thinks that they can do things where a man says to do it, and yet please God. It cannot happen. Now I'd like to look at something on the other end of the spectrum. What happens to you or I when we make our mate angry with us, our spouse angry with us, or maybe we have. Okay, It's, it's not uncommon. Maybe a Christian man or a woman, it's not uncommon got caught in a trap and did not stay as close to God as they need to be and start losing respect for God and His Word and maybe did see another man or woman and you found out. How about the person that is doing the awful crime? How do they feel? Yeah, they begin to feel guilty. They begin to feel all tied up caught in a dark trap and cannot escape it and the only thing they know to do is to continue in it wondering if will my wife or my husband ever take me back will they ever forgive me yeah well that may not happen with men okay or women but God will forgive you and me if we're messing around with another God another teaching, another so-called church. He will forgive us, but we have to repent of that. In other words, repentance is a change of mind of what we're doing, and we turn back to God, begin doing what He wants us to do. Our God is a jealous God. You know, it's time for preachers to quit saying that He's an all-loving God so much and add some of these other characteristics to God in the picture. He is a jealous God. In Zechariah chapter 1, starting with verse 10. 
And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sits still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against that thou hast against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem." You see, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah were going to horn around, mixing with other nationalities. And God began to get jealous and made him angry. And he didn't show his mercy and his grace upon on, on the Jews for 30 years. And then he heard their cry. And he began to have mercy and grace upon them again. And he said that he is a jealous God. Our God is a jealous God. The Bible should teach you and me. We're to love those who are the denominational world like any person in the world. But we should not be caught up in with what they're doing. We should not be agreeing with what they're teaching. We're in the world, the Bible says, but we're not a part of it. You know, you might have your address on a certain street here in Dillsboro or Madison or wherever. But this is not our home. We're just passing through. This is not our home. Our home is with Jesus in heaven someday when we leave this life. That's our home. And we need to take care of that. We have an address in the kingdom of God and in that eternal kingdom right now. Jesus said in John chapter 14 that in his Father's house are many mansions. And he goes to prepare a place for you. And when he comes back, he says, Where I am, there ye may be also. We will be where Jesus is at right now, sitting at his Father's right hand, around the throne. That's our home. And we need to take care of that right now while we're in this life, or we can lose it. We need to understand. <laughs> we need to understand. <laughs> Apart from God, studying God's Word, we can't please God. We can't do the things that doesn't make Him jealous. Apart from God's Word, we will begin to do things that make Him jealous and angry. That's how important it is. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 8. And verse 1 and 2. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. They were whoring around. They were mixing with other nationalities. They were not only trying to serve the true living God, but other gods, molten gods, images. And God became jealous. And He didn't show forth His mercy and His grace upon Jerusalem. Then at another time He did. He began doing that. He was jealous over her. See, that's what it says. He was jealous over her. And that's who we are. We are the her, the church, the church of Christ, the kingdom of God. We are the her. 
And He gets jealous over us. You see, if we're not studying God's Word, we ought to have the fear we might make our husband jealous of us. For 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth and also to the church today. It doesn't mention anywhere else after Zechariah that says God is a jealous God. Okay? Or I am a jealous God. But Paul refers to it here. Second Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 1. This is a letter to the church at Corinth and to the church today, wherever she might be. Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly. Indeed, bear with me. This is a time where there were those who claimed to be apostles, but they were false apostles. They were found out to be liars. There are all kinds of people trying to represent God, but they were doing it falsely. We see that all around us today. The denominational churches. They're trying to represent God, but they're doing it falsely. And it's time for the church to recognize it. It's time for the church to acknowledge not all these denominational churches, not all these people that are affiliated with these denominational churches are going to heaven. They're going to be lost. And we're friends with some of them. Some of them are our family, and that's okay. Some of them are loved ones, and we care for them. But we need to be careful that they do not drag us from the true living God to serve a false God. That's what Satan wants. That's what Satan wants. That's the folly that Paul was saying, bear with me a little in my folly. He said in verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Paul said that. Paul, our brother in Christ, whom has now died and gone to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, when he wrote this, he said, I am jealous over you. Who is he talking to? The she, the church. Okay? The church. He's talking to the Christian. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. When he makes that statement there, there's such thing as godly jealousy and ungodly jealousy. Jealousy is a characteristic of God, being jealous. Every one of us, if we're in our right mind, ought to become jealous when our spouse is messing around with someone else. We ought to become jealous. If, there's, if you're not, there's something wrong with you and me. Because God gets jealous. That's a godly jealousy. But jealousy sometimes goes too far and turns into an ungodly jealousy. Okay? And we need to be careful that we don't go that far. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. God, the Lord Jesus, the Apostle, the Apostle Paul espoused us to one husband. That was the law back then. Did you know back in, in, in the Old Testament that the fathers made the decision whom they were going to marry. Yeah, they espoused their daughters to, or their sons to. Well, Paul wasn't doing it physically, but spiritually he was doing it. <clears throat> he says, I have espoused you to one husband. Do you know that in the denominational world that they preach Jesus? But it's another Jesus. It's another Jesus. The Bible says so. Let's go on. And may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The church is Christ. It belongs to Him. He died for her. He built her. It belongs to Him. It's His. The church is His. 
The church is his wife. The church is his bride. He's the husband. He's the bridegroom. He's the head of the church, which is his body. Ephesians chapter 2 and the last two verses. There is one church. Now I bet you, I bet you, if I was to do a survey, that I could go to the churches of Christ and I could find one or more people who believe that the church of Christ is not the only church that's going to heaven. Who believe that there is good people in every church. There are people in the Baptist church who are going to heaven. People in the Methodist church who are going to heaven. People in the Lutheran church who are going to heaven. People in the Catholic church who are going to heaven. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am here to declare because of what God says in the Bible that there is only one church. It's the church of Christ. The Bible says so. And I, therefore I'm not going to say anything different than what the Bible says. If I did, I would become like the denominational churches, saying something different than what the Bible says. He went on to say in verse 3, But I fear Paul was a man of fear. He feared lest any means as the serpent beguiled E through his ability, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ, that we have God's Word, okay? We don't have to rely upon anybody else's Word. God will lead us from this life into the next. He is the only true living God. And there is no other like Him, the Bible says. And He, Paul feared, just as a serpent beguiled Eve, that He can also, if we let Him, beguile our and corrupt our minds. You see, we're not to have corrupt minds as being Christians. When we repented of our sins, were baptized, God washed them sins away. And He washed away the power and the guilt of sin. He cleaned us up. We put on a white robe of righteousness. That's how God sees us when we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And our minds is where the battle place is. It begins right here. You see, we're to, Ephesians says we're to put off something and then put on something. We put off the old man, the old ways of life. They put on the new man, the new ways of life. You see, Paul feared that our minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In verse 4, For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if, we, if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You see, Paul here says, there are those who are preaching another Jesus. And I'm telling you this morning, I'm proclaiming unto you that the denominational churches are preaching another Jesus. When they will leave the plan of salvation now, that the Word of God says and put their own in, they're preaching another Jesus. I'm telling you this morning that Jesus and the apostles and the early church said you had to repent of your sins and be baptized to have those sins washed away and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and become a part of God's kingdom. The Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Catholic church, etc., 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 do not teach that. They do not teach that. And therefore, they're teaching something different than what the Word of God says. And so therefore, they're preaching another Jesus. We as the Lord's church should not be a part of that. But we ought to be better than that. We ought to know the truth. We ought to be prepared when the opportunity arises that we can show them that they're being deceived and show them the truth. You see, that's what studying the Bible does. The goal of the Christian, the goal of the church is to seek and save the lost in this world today. If you're not studying the Word of God and you're not preparing yourself to be able to do that, God gets jealous. 
Your husband, as being the Lord God, gets jealous. He gets jealous. And he gets angry. And therefore, he requires repentance in his church. Repentance. What about you today? Are you a Christian this morning? And you've not spent enough time in God's Word to know how to please Him? Are you a Christian that it just could be that you've made God, your husband, jealous over you? And you don't know it? Could it be that you want to know how to please God and not make Him jealous? My friend, my advice to you is to repent where you're at right now from what you're doing and start over again. You know what's what Revelation chapter 2 says? Turn back to your first love and do the first works. That's what it says. Return to your first love who is Jesus Christ. He's the bridegroom. He's the husband of the church. Return back to him. And then stop doing what you're doing and go back and start over again. You remember when you first became a Christian, when you first came out of that water grave of baptism? What it was like? Go back to that and begin and start over again. And do it right. That's what the Bible says. If you're not a Christian this morning, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living. And you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have their sins washed away and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word. Unto the end. Bye.